Okay, so I'll start. So first of all, thank you, Jean-Philippe, for organizing this <laughs> amazing conference. I'm really enjoying it since we are getting towards the end of the conference. I think we can start thanking you. And I will tell you about physics of algorithms or you know, statistical physics of computation. This is the logo of my lab in Lausanne. People sometimes think computational statistical physics. No, we actually study the algorithms or the computation. So talking about heroes in, in talks, I guess my hero should be this gentleman. And that's uh, the man that uh, you know, lived uh, almost uh, or more than a one millennia ago and after whom the algorithms are actually called. And when we think about an algorithm, this is I took from Wikipedia, when you go to Wikipedia algorithms, you see the, the, the kind of structure of the Euclid's algorithm for the greatest common divisor of two numbers. So, you know, it's something simple. In elementary school, we understood what it is. You don't think about it necessarily as a complex system where something can emerge. But when you think about the algorithms that are kind of driving technology today, I couldn't really take a picture of the algorithm. So instead, I'm giving you the picture of the systems that they are able to solve. So algorithms are able to beat people at Go, and they are able to translate from any language to any language, and they are able to fold proteins in unprecedented way. Those are complex systems. So can we study them with the tools of, uh, of physics, of statistical physics, in the spirit of this conference. So more is different and algorithms. What do these two have together? So as an example of kind of emergence, phase transition, to be more, pre to be more concrete at the beginning, uh, in algorithms, I just give you a very simple toy model so that we are kind of on the same line and then there will be two variants of that same model and then another model. So I, that's something that those who have seen me talking have maybe already seen, but you know, for everybody. Imagine that we have a you know, certain number of people in the room, like yourself here, and I have a deck of cards. Each card has either plus one or minus one on it. I distribute one card to each of you. And you don't show me your cards. The game is between you and me. I have to guess your cards. But I'm not a magician. I need some information from you so that I can guess the cards. So the information that I ask you, okay, here I distributed the cards. And the information that I ask you, I pick two among you. And I ask you, can you please take a Gaussian number with variance, random Gaussian number with variance delta star? Delta will be then you know, appearing later and either add to it 1 over square root of n, where n is the number of people, if your cards are the same, so you look at each other's cards, if they are the same, you draw a random number that is Gaussian, if they are the same, you add 1 over square root of n, if they are different, you subtract 1 over square root of n. That's it. And then I go through every possible pair in the room, and I collect this matrix, y, i, j, for all the pairs, and x star, X i i is the index for the person in the room. So I collect this matrix y, y i j, and then my goal is to recover the cards, of course, up to the up-down symmetry, right? In the information, you are only giving me information about the product, so I cannot say, like, in, in other words, can I split the room in two groups so that in the two groups, people have uh, the same cards from the knowledge of the y. So that's a very concrete problem. How do we go about it to state it mathematically? What, what do we need to do to, to do that? So we just write the base formula of what are the cards, given what I observe, that is simply given like that, and putting in mathematically the rules of the game, which means that the cards were plus minus one, that's this term, and the fact that you were drawing a random Gaussian number with variance delta and adding or subtracting from it the product of the two cards divided by square root of n, then this is a probability distribution on n numbers, 
given the observations. If I was able to compute or when, you know, computing the marginals of this probability distribution, so local magnetizations, as you'll see in the physics sense, this is the optimal way to split the room into two groups, and no procedure in the world can do better. So that's a simple, uh, you know, that can be simply proved. So when we look at it from the physics point of view formulation, you take this posterior probability distribution, you expand this exponent, and you, know, you collect the terms that do not depend on the cards in a normalization, that's your partition function, and what you're left with in the exponent is a Hamiltonian. <laughs> and this Hamiltonian has a form that many of you are familiar with. That's the mean field Ising spin glass, or in other words, the schering kirkpatrick model. Just that this interaction Yaj is actually conditioned on the existence of the ground true value of the curves, that's X star. So it's not completely random. We call it the planted disorder. And once I formulated it this way, OK, we are in the framework of statistical physics where we know what to do. We can now compute many things and end up with you know, this figure that is telling us what can I do in terms of splitting the room. And here is the kind of first occurrence of an emergence. Because if the room was very large, then the performance, the error that I'm doing will either be just as bad as random guessing, if this variance of the noise delta was bigger than one, and will be better than that, going to zero, if the variance of the noise was smaller than one. And this is a phase transition, just like between ferromagnet and paramagnet that we know from you know, magnetic systems and iron, the, one, the, the second order phase transition. OK. so. Phase transitions can emerge in algorithms, in the behavior of algorithms. Now, I didn't really tell you yet which algorithm achieves this, because this procedure that I described and that I can analyze that computes the marginals of the posterior probability distribution when the system is large is actually exponentially costly. And we cannot do computation that is exponentially costly in the system size if the system size is really big. So. And that's, that's you know, in this conference, every talk should have the Anderson moment. So this is, this is my Anderson moment. The tractable way of doing this, that works, that is efficient, is actually going back to the Taulas and Anderson polymer equations and the associated algorithm, which here I write it in a form that you're probably not used to see. Because I just wanted to be generic and wanted to keep the deck of the distribution of the cards in the deck not to be only the plus minus one, but I wanted to keep it generic. And you can actually generalize these top equations to that case. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Another thing that is actually crucial, it seems like a tiny little detail with respect to the Taulas Anderson Palmer paper from 76, but it actually waited for, let's see, 40 years or so to be kind of realized that the time indices in this iterative algorithm, these are the local magnetizations, this is a time index, you iterate, you start somehow randomly, that the time indices are not the most obvious ones. You don't have time t, t here, and you augment the time here. Here you have actually the previous time step. And so the, the time indices need to be, in a sense, corrected. And when you use the right time indices, then, again, magic happens, and you can actually analyze what this algorithm is doing at every iteration. And this is summarized in this slide. So that one is you know, a bit heavy. It's called the state evolution. So what is the state evolution saying about the performance of this approximate message passing? That's how it's called in, say, machine learning signal processing, or TAP equations. It's, for me, it's the same thing. The statement is that the error that this algorithm is doing is given by a log, again, in the, therm in the limit when the system is large, is given by the local maximum of a function that is the free entropy. Uh, that is a function of one scalar parameter m. So the algorithm that, was, you know, that had one number or two numbers per every person in the room, so many numbers, now this is just a scalar function. M is here just a parameter. It's just a function of one parameter. You need to plot it. So if you 
if you actually get the local maximum of the free energy that is reached by ascent when you start from m that is zero, that's the performance that the algorithm gives you. And that's state evolution. This, in the terms of the physics of spin glasses, this is the replica symmetric free energy. Or entropy with minus sign. Now, in many of these systems, we know that the replica symmetry is not always correct, but here we don't care. This is a theorem that if you want the error that the algorithm is giving you, you need to take the replica symmetric free entropy, and that's giving you the performance of the algorithm. And if you wanted the optimal error, independently of the complexity of the algorithm, then you need to take the same function and you need to take its global maximum, not the local one. So, of course, if there is a unique maximum, the two are the same, and that was the previous case, and everything is, everything is fine. Now, where it will get interesting is that when actually there are multiple maxima, usually two, and the IMP gets to the lower one. So, the point that I want to make you know, in the next, say, 10 minutes is kind of going back to the message of this slide, is that the approximate message passing, that is this particular algorithm, follows what some function that is called the replica symmetric free energy is telling it to do. And it does that so even when the physics of the system actually does not follow that replica symmetric solution at all. And this is something where it will get interesting. But let me first show you know, an example where, where, where this happens, where actually we have two different maxima uh, in this function. We, you know, and that will be a case of a first order phase transition. So in physics, you know, first order phase transition between water and vapor or ice and water, how do we get a first order discontinuous phase transition in our card game? So we just need to change the rules a little bit. We really you know, do basically not much. I just need to add, for instance, many ways to do that, but one way to do that is I need to add a lot of cards with value zero in my deck. And that's enough. In this case, I add 92% of cards with value zero in my deck, and then we play the same game. I distribute them, you give me a random number plus the product. So many of you, you know, at least one of you will have zero, so for many of you the product will be zero, so for many pairs I will just be getting the random number. But for some pairs you will have either the same cards or two different cards, neither of them zero, so you will be giving me some information about what were the cards. And I play the same game. Again, I can use the very same uh, computation and analysis and plot the overlap with the ground truth value of the cards that I get as a function of the noise. The value one of the noise that was important before is still important here. That's actually when you know, a fixed point that is, so in blue here are stable fixed points, and in red are unstable fixed points. So the stable fixed points are those you know, to which uh, one can possibly converge, and the ones that, where I lose one of the fixed points, that's a spinodal of the first order phase transition, the other spinodal of the first order phase transition, and then in first order phase transitions, I need to compare the values of the free energies of the two branches to decide where actually at equilibrium is the first order phase transition, in which in this case it will be here. But now if I look what this figure means from the point of view of the algorithms, let me interpret it from the point of view of the algorithms. It means that if I want to reach an accuracy, a split of the room that is good enough, um, then it is not possible in the purple region. This is impossible. Whatever algorithm I use, there is not enough information in what I observe to actually say with better accuracy than this purple curve how to split the people in the room. If I am in the green region, then it's easy, and the approximate message passing algorithm will do it for me. And then there is this intermediate region that here I called hard, where it is possible in principle, but this algorithm will not do it. Now, this is, you know, you know the, 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 the origin of this algorithmic hardness is pretty much the same origin as the origin of the metastability in, say, diamond, which at room temperature and normal pressure is actually not at equilibrium. At equilibrium, it would want to be graphite, but it stays diamond nevertheless for a very long time. 
well, in finite dimension, not infinitely long time, but here we are, you know, the dimension in our card game is the number of people, so the dimension is very big, is really for exponential time that the algorithm will stay stuck at the bad accuracy. Okay, fine. Now, is physical dynamics as good as the approximate message passing? Or is it even better? So actually, it cannot be better. There is a pretty long-standing conjecture that this approximate message passing algorithm in this problem is the best of the efficient algorithms that you can get. That's kind of a deep conjecture that has a lot of follow-up works and related works in computer science. But here I'm asking about the other side. You know, what is the physical dynamics? Is it at least reaching what, this, what these Taulas, Anderson, Palmer equations are able to do for us? Or is it actually worse? This is something that if you asked me three years ago, I would have said, of course, it's reaching what the Taulas, Anderson, Palmer equations are able to do because it's all replica symmetric. There is nothing wrong here. But so that's actually not the case, to my surprise, a few years back. So in this paper with, um, with Pier Francesco Urbani and Silvio and our postdoc Fabrizio, we actually provide a pretty generic argument that in the cases where you have the hard phase, that means you have the first order phase transition in these computational problems, then its existence causes hurdles for the physical dynamics, gradient-based, Elangevin, gradient-descent algorithms beyond the, beyond the hard phase. But in this paper, we did not like, quantify it very well. But let me, let me show you a model in which actually we managed to quantify this nicely. And that's something called mixed spike matrix sensor model. So what is that? So it's again, don't worry, it's just a simple variant of our card game again. So just you know, bear in mind. The first equation here, that's exactly the same as the card game. Delta 2 is the variance of the Gaussian noise that you're generating. And the change of the rules of the game is that next to collecting this information from every pair, I will also take every triple. Every triple among you, okay? And, every, and I will ask you to do the same. You multiply your cards, you add a random Gaussian number, and that's an additional information that I have that I can use to infer the cards. But otherwise, the, the rule of the game is the same. And here I just changed, actually, in this for the figure I will be showing you, the cards are no longer plus minus ones, but the, the, the distribution of the values in the deck themselves is a Gaussian number. So, okay, that's another little change of the game. But from the methodological point of view, how, how, we, how we analyze these things, this doesn't change much. So let's go on. What is the phase diagram of the... Again, the approximate message passing and the optimal performance. Here now I have just two <coughs> axes. It's one over the noise on the matrix and one and the noise on the tensor, on the, on the term where I'm asking products of triples. So again, I have a phase where it's impossible, where it's hard and where it's easy. Of course, when the noises are large, it's impossible. When the noises are small, it's easy. And this is how it behaves in between. Okay, this is something we can prove. There is a theorem about that in that paper. And now my question was about the physical dynamics. Elaine, could you say again the, the definition of the hard and the impossible? Yeah. So impossible is when no algorithmic procedure in the world can get any correlation whatsoever with the values of the cards. Okay? It's just information theoretically. The information was lost, there was too much noise, the matrix that I observe is just a random matrix. It's equivalent to a random matrix. Easy is that the approximate message passing, the top equations are able to give me the optimal performance. And hard is it's possible. If I did exponential, you know, if I exhausted all the possibilities, I would have found the right solution. But the top equations do not get me there. And so now, Going to you know, top equations, maybe we don't have, you know, okay, now I, after many years studying them, I have some intuition about them, but, you know, most of the physicists in the audience will be more familiar with something like the Langevin dynamics, Langevin algorithm, or the gradient flow. Okay, so you take the cost function, the Hamiltonian, as usual, you, you make a derivative, take the gradient with respect to the values of the cards. That's why I needed to take them Gaussian so that I can easily make the derivatives. 
And then you can add white noise if you want. In that case, it corresponds to the Langevin at a given temperature, or you don't put that noise, and in that case, it corresponds to the gradient flow. And if you want to keep a spherical constraint, then you put a term like that or not. Okay, this is kind of, this doesn't play an important role here. And then you ask how do these algorithms come, uh, how do they actually compare, where do they fall in my phase diagram? So this is something that we can analyze with the dynamical mean field theory about which we heard already in, in, several, uh, in several talks, and that's what we did and the f in this paper. And the phase diagram that we get is the following one for the Langevin algorithm. There is this additional phase that for the approximate message passing for the top was easy, but the Langevin is not managing to find anything whatsoever correlated with the ground truth split of the room, you know, of, of people according to the values of their cards. So that is something that, that, you know, that, that I was saying, that if there is the hard phase somewhere, then it extends to a much larger region where actually the, the physical dynamics fails. Even though from the static point of view, everything is replica symmetric there, when we actually follow where the dynamics goes, it goes to a region that is glassy, and this is why it fits. And if we just do the, the gradient descent, except the, 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 instead the Langevin, it's even slightly worse because the gradient descent is actually kind of doing the, going there too fast, and it's not even aiming to sample the right posterior measure. So, so this is a kind of a generic phenomenon that when there is the hard phase, the dynamics is getting actually difficult. And now, okay, now going back to these examples, to my kind of complicated algorithms, what does this type of analysis or this result imply for learning with deep neural networks, which are these objects that are behind the algorithms solving these systems? So for that, you know, here just one, in one slide, what are these deep neural networks doing? Well, they are in a sense ansatzes for functions by which you are fitting your data. So you have some data on the input, data on the output. You're looking for a function that would map the input to the output. This can be any function. In neural network, you actually take a specific function that has this form, is simply a product of the input times a matrix, nonlinearity applied component-wise, and you repeat that several times. The number of times you repeat that is the number of layers, and in a graphics, you kind of represent this function in this way. Okay. And then the core of machine learning today. So in the algorithms that are behind the AlphaGo, AlphaFold, the Google Translate, and many more, what is done is nothing else than taking many labeled examples of the corresponding data, a big computer with a lot of GPUs, and to run gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, uh, to minimize some kind of a loss function, which is some kind of distance between what your current function is predicting and what the right prediction is, and you're adjusting these parameters w here, you're minimizing over them by running the gradient descent. And that's kind of the workhorse of deep learning, the gradient descent with some on some loss function. And now if you connect to what I said previously, you will start to get a bit worried because I told you that the gradient descent is not doing really well compared to the approximate message passing. So let's see, let's take some you know, caricature model in, in the language of, uh, of, of this morning to actually demonstrate that. So the model that we like to work with in studying, uh, in studying neural networks is the following, is the teacher-student setting, where on the input, you know, in practice, you would get some images, for instance, I don't know, cats and dogs, something. Here, the caricature is in the fact that we actually take the input data, just IID, Gaussian, random matrices, nothing with no structure at all. And then we postulate some teacher neural network that could look like this, and us and take some weights that will be, again, random Gaussian variables, and the teacher neural network will produce the labels. Now we op the student network observes the inputs and the labels, the architecture, for simplicity, that can only make things easier, not more complicated. And the goal is to learn the teacher's function from x to y, on, from given number of samples of these x and y. 
So the caricature model on which I will show you how you know, the, the, the algorithmic uh, result is the so-called phase retrieval, which is the simplest possible case of a neural network where there are no hidden units. So this picture is actually the same picture as Francesco was showing us yesterday, the perceptron. That's, that's like the perceptron. The only difference from the perceptron is that here the teacher, when it produces labels, it's actually doing absolute value of the scalar product. In the perceptron, as it was studied many times in physics for 30 years, it was taking a sign of the scalar product. Okay, but that's the only difference. Again, because it's kind of sign derivatives of signs is kind of nothing. So, so, so this, is, this is a function on which the gradient descent actually makes more sense. So we call this the sign or phase retrieval. We look at it as a regression problem, again, from samples that are generated by the teacher. And this actually is a problem that, is, that has many applications in signal processing and imaging. So it is interesting per se, beyond being a caricature model for these neural networks. So how does it behave? Again, if I have a look at the performance of the approximate message passing and the optimal performance, I get a picture like that. As a, number of, as a function of number of samples per dimension, so this is parameter that I fix and the dimension and the number of samples I send it to infinity, so that's my thermodynamic limit. The test error I get, of course, if I have few samples, it's hard to learn something. If I have more samples, it's easier. So the test error I get is this orange curve would be the optimal one. That can be done if I have exponentially costly algorithmic procedure. The blue curve is the state evolution of the approximate message passing. And the red points is the actual run of the approximate message passing or TAP. So the blue curve indeed agrees with the red points. And there is a little hard phase here. You know, instead of getting just more samples than the dimension, I need something like 13% more samples than the dimension. So that doesn't seem much. That seems pretty inconsequential, such a small difference that will never matter in practice. So why should I care about this hard phase? But now remember the hard phase was actually causing hurdles for the gradient descents. And as I told you, in machine learning, we always use gradient descent. We don't know how to train deep neural networks, complicated ones, more complicated than this caricature model with anything like the top equations. This we don't know how to write. So we, 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 we will look at the performance of the gradient flow. On a loss function, that is some loss function that kind of makes sense. And it's even giving away the information that there was an absolute value. That's why I'm comparing the label square to the scalar product square. That's kind of making it simpler. It's not that I'm hiding from the loss function that there was this absolute value. So this is a very natural function. Minimizing it should work just fine. What do I know about it? I put on an axis, again, the number of samples over dimension. The performance information theoretically, where it starts to do well, is 1. The AMP starts to do well at 1.13. Here, these are just papers from computer science that, can actually, that actually prove this about the gradient descent. The, the best proof is that the gradient descent is some large constant times the dimension to actually work in this problem. And if we simply try numerically, then we find something like seven. So we did that in, in, in this paper over here. So, so here you see that despite the hard phase being really tiny for the AMP, for the gradient descent, this has a big consequence. You know, I need something like seven times or even more samples to actually be able to get a good performance. OK, so that's a demonstration of this generic hard. But now, can we somehow close this gap? between the gradient descent and the approximate message passing. How is that being done? And this would brings me, you know, this is a caricature of what is going on in the neural networks in deep learning. But can I kind of use it to explain or a posteriori explain some of the key facts that we know about how training these neural networks work? And one of the key facts is over-parametrization. And that's something that we have already heard yesterday in Jim's talk. It was mentioned, maybe in several more, that the neural networks actually that we are using in practice, responsible for the three applications I was giving, they actually have many more parameters even than the number of samples. They have ridiculously many parameters. And it's kind of strange. Why should they? 
Okay, but it's, it's, it's how the world is, it's how nature is. Now, as physicists, you know, best we can do is try to explain. Okay. So let's see if we now take an over-parameterized neural network, what it does. And that's what we did in this paper with my student uh, Stefano and Eric, two years back. Eric was here yesterday and he's still today. So all we need to do to over-parameterize, to put in the over-parameterization, is we just slightly change the loss function. We really don't do much. What we do is that we add here the sum over m hidden units, corresponding to this kind of picture of the neural network. And we need the m for our theorem here to work to be larger than the dimension, at least by one, okay? or, or, or something else. If it is smaller, it's okay. So it's not much. We are just optimizing a different loss function. Now, when you think about it from the point of view of the Bayesians, where in Bayesian inference, you actually, if you know something about your model, you want to use it. Right here, you know the model. You know that this sum is not there. You know that there is a W, so that without this sum, or for m equal 1, if you want, you get the right function. So here you are mismatching the model. You are actually asking the algorithm to optimize a completely wrong function. OK. But if you do that, and that's a theorem and you know, numerics from this paper, you actually see that in the over-parameterized neural network, the gradient descent will work starting from the sample complexity 2. So you know, it, got, it, it closed a good part of the gap. So the over-parameterized neural network here, trained by gradient descent, I didn't change anything about the algorithm, needs way fewer samples to learn phase retrieval. So this is where it gets interesting. And kind of in the spirit of the conference, I try to be, you know, provoke a bit and be philosophical. Could it be that some properties, here for instance, the over-parameterization that is omnipresent in neural networks, emerge but this time as a consequence of the requirement of computational efficiency. Of course, if we want to do something and it cannot be done computationally efficiently, well, then it cannot be done. So it kind of makes sense that some things that we observe in the world could be a consequence of this requirement alone, and that's it. So this over-parameterization, you know, I am presenting it to you as one example, but very shortly, let, let me present to you another one. So the marginality of dynamics in glasses. So this is something that here I take a review that, that Marcus and Mathieu, Mathieu wrote uh, some time ago that is very nice you know, for, you know, for people kind of that didn't fall. There are many, many papers that I should have cited here that, that we see that the dynamics <coughs> in complex systems converges to marginality just on the edge between the unstable states and the stable states, there are always some spins that have magnetic field zero or that have, you know, in the Hessians, some of the eigenvalues are very small. The density at zero eigenvalues is kind of not zero. There is a sometimes pseudo gap, sometimes there are many of them. But there is this marginality in the dynamics everywhere. And, you know, I am in the field maybe 15 years now. I have seen a lot of times you know, there is this principle of margin marginality. Sometimes we can analyze the dynamics. We see that it goes to marginal states. But what, why? So, OK, that's kind of a realization that, that came to me, or hypothesis, or maybe provocative hypothesis, that came to me when, when looking at, at a problem that kind of has nothing to do with this generic question in a paper with, with my students just, just recently. So what we actually studied there, in a way, is the following problem. So we looked at gap states in spin glasses, or in the SK model, that would be defined as configurations of you know, spins, so that the local fields on the spin i are actually such that all of them are bigger than h, okay, some, for some h. And then we came up, you know, we, we analyzed that problem and, and realized that it has the following phase diagram. When the h is negative, well, then it's very easy. When h is zero, these are actually the single spin flip stable states of the Glauber dynamics. So we can definitely find states where the Glauber dynamics converges. So h zero is, you know, still easy. 
But what's interesting, and of course, if H is too big, then those states do not exist anymore. It cannot be that the spins arrange in a way that the field on everybody is very big. It's a disordered system. The interactions are random. That cannot be. This number up to which they exist is actually 0 0.351. I should have put here a reference uh, where actually 30 years ago in some papers it appeared. We kind of reproduced that. But in between, when the H is strictly between 0 and this number, what actually happens, we could show that these gapped states, they are separated geometrically in the same sense as Francesco was showing us yesterday in the constraint satisfaction problems. But here even more, here each cluster, which would be this point, is really a single solution. And in order to walk to another solution, we need to walk an extensive distance. And in this problem, this is actually something that we could relatively straightforwardly prove. And in computer science, that corresponds to something called the overlap gap property. And that's kind of a line of work in theoretical computer science that where we can show that a huge class of algorithms, if there is an overlap gap property in these constraint satisfaction problems, then none you know, algorithm from a huge class can actually find those solutions. So what I am telling to you here is that there is a very, you know, with our analysis and results taken from the computer science literature, there is a very solid evidence that the gap states are actually computationally hard to find. And so if they're hard to find, well, then any dynamics that actually goes somewhere must go to the marginal ones, because that's the only possibility left. And could it be that this omnipresent marginality in the dynamics of complex systems is just coming from this requirement of the computational efficiency, because finding anything stable is actually computationally hard. I don't know. And that brings me to, to conclude. So well, I showed you that many algorithms using computer science, statistics, signal processing, machine learning, you pick, can be studied using physics of disordered systems, can be viewed as complex systems in the same way as we are viewing, I don't know, the universe, the brain, the economy, the behavior of the current algorithms that we are using these days. It's just kind of one example of those. I showed you that the first order phase transitions, when they arrive in some thermodynamic limit, imply sharply defined algorithmic heart regions. And then existence of those actually causes in kind of generally hurdles for wi widely used algorithms, such as gradient-based algorithms, such as any kind of physical physics-based dynamics. So it's not, so here I just may be commenting back on the, on the magic, how does that happen, right? I told, so the physical uh, algorithms, they will actually be exploring some space of the landscape that is glassy and they will get stuck there even though the, and, and the approximate message passing that, you know, from the theorem of the state evolution is just following the replica symmetric free energy, even though that free energy is wrong in that case, it just manages to ignore it. So, so that's kind of an interesting interplay between what an algorithm that ignores wanting to be physical, having detailed balance and doing sampling in the direct space or something like that, what it can achieve, it can jump around, it can ignore kind of the hurdles that the physics would have. So I told you some examples of that. And at the end, you know, I kind of put forward this idea whether at least part of the emergence that we see in the behavior and the properties of the natural world could come from the simple fact as a consequence of the requirement of computational tractability of what's actually happening. And that's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you.